Okay, hello. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Let's uh, stay on schedule um, today. So uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon uh, from wherever you're joining us. Thank you. Uh, my name is Thomas Meredith and I'm the Marketing Director for RTM Consulting. On behalf of RTM Consulting, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webcast, Control the Controllable, Proven Best Practices in Reducing Parts Cost. Uh, we do have a lot to cover today, um, but before we begin, I'd like to cover just a few of our standard housekeeping items. Uh, a copy of the deck uh, that you'll see here is available if you're interested. Uh, if you can email your request to info at rtmconsulting.net and we'll send that out to you. Um, again, info at rtmconsulting.net and I can get a PDF copy sent out to anyone who's interested. We are recording the webcast as well. Uh, we'll get that archived and up on the site. Um, and then you will be receiving an email, um, an automated email from Citrix GoToWebinar uh, when that's ready to go. And there will be a link there where you can uh, view the recording at your convenience. Uh, as always, we are taking questions in, in today's webinar. Uh, I'll reiterate that we're not going to stop the webcast as these questions come in. But uh, as you see the content come up, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the questions panel there on your GoToWebinar screen. I will be collecting those throughout the webcast and we'll have a brief Q&A session at the end. Uh, and for anyone on the line who is interested, uh, there is a one PDU web-based instruction credit uh, available for today's uh, content. And that information uh, to claim that PDU will be available at the end of the webinar. Uh, we'll bring that up right before our Q&A session. Okay, that takes care of my uh, housekeeping items. Thank you for uh, bearing with me through that. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have a lot of content, so I'd like to get started. Uh, presenting today's uh, webinar uh, for our team consulting is Randy Mislovic. Uh, Randy, welcome. I'll hand it off to you. Excellent, uh, Thomas. Uh, just a quick sound check. You can hear me okay? Your audio sounds good, yes. Per perfect, thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for our uh, webcast, Control the Controllable, Proven Best Practices in Reducing Parts Costs. Um, I'm Randy Mislovic, uh, Managing Partner um, of RTM Consulting uh, at RTM Consulting. And joining us today are uh, two guest speakers, uh, Val Golovsky, who is Vice President of Research Field Services for the Technology Services Industry Association and Bill Steenberg, Senior Vice President at uh, Pitney Bowes Corporation, and uh, Bill uh, manages their global services business. So welcome both Bill and Bill. It's a, a pleasure to have both of them here today uh, with us. Um, I, the, uh, the webcast, we're going to cover a number of things. We'll talk briefly about some objectives that we're uh, going to try to cover as we go through our webcast today. Um, I'll set the stage a little bit for the, the background on, on why this whole area of parts visibility is uh, an area of interest as we work with our clients and certainly an opportunity for any company um, that uh, has a field services discipline. And hopefully you'll have some good takeaways from this webcast that will be helpful to you and your businesses. Um, the Technology Services Industry Association does some really great uh, research work in a, a number of services disciplines. Uh, Bell has responsibility for uh, field services, and he's going to share with you some research and perspectives on parts variability um, in his parts. Um, Bill and myself are going to tag team a bit on a couple of different client case studies. Um, one at uh, Pitney Bowes, obviously, where Bill uh, leads that services business, and a, and a second at uh, at MCR, uh, also a client of ours, and we'll share some data that uh, MCR shared at the last Technology Services Industry Association conference in Las Vegas uh, last October. And then we'll, uh, as uh, Thomas indicated, we'll take time to uh, uh, take questions uh, for the panel. So with that, let me dive into the, the objectives for our uh, webcast today. Certainly at the top of the list is um, variability is a, a sometimes overlooked area of parts cost management that can quickly lead to a substantial amount of savings. And I know that field services leaders today are always being squeezed or pressed on their budgets. And this is a great place that uh, if you're not focused on variability to, to inspect, understand the data, and potentially drive some economic value uh, to the uh, to the bottom line, a six sig leading six sigma is uh, certainly a part of the work that we did in both of these cases, uh, both the client cases we're going to show, and, and it is a part of our four-step transformational process to lead toward uh, 
uh, better outcomes uh, for your services transformation, in, in this case for uh, parts variability. Um, Bell, is, again, is going to talk a little bit more about uh, their uh, uh, benchmarking and how they go about doing that and research in that space. And there's some really valuable data there that uh, I think will be helpful to everyone. And then uh, certainly learn some uh, practical advice from um, leaders like uh, 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 Bill Steinberg, uh, who have you know, been there, done that. So. So some background, uh, just to give a very brief commercial on our company, RTM Consulting. We, um, in a nutshell, help consulting professionals, support and field services organizations get better at what they do. And we, we basically, if you're a services entity and a technology company doing any aspect of services to include those things I mentioned, or educational services, managed services, we help services entities transform into you know, lean, mean fighting machines. We we do both management and operational consulting. Our company is made up of mostly people who are um, practitioners um, uh, from uh, past operational roles. Um, we think we're very different in the regard of our profile of how we uh, build uh, talented consulting talent that uh, actually has been there, done that. We're doing business for over 100 clients on different five on five continents, and we're very cl proud of our. Um, of our list of, of customers. This is a, uh, a, uh, myself, I, I'll just in a nutshell tell you, I've been in the technology industry since 1977. That certainly dates me a bit, but uh, time at both IBM and a, a very large uh, outsourcing uh, company called Convergys here in Cincinnati where we are headquartered. Um, and the Convergys uh, ran and operated uh, call centers um, all around the globe more than 65,000 call center agents answering the phone for both technical support, customer support, and a lot of other uh, type of uh, uh, operations that uh, required uh, support uh, capabilities. And so I, I have an interesting background across uh, a variety of the uh, services disciplines to include professional services, support, and, and, and field and educational services. Um, and uh, we've been in business now uh, not quite eight years, and I'm proud to be both the, the, the founder of the company as well as a, the ma a managing partner within the organization. You can look at our client list out on our website. This is a, just a sampling of the kinds of companies that have put their confidence in RTM Consulting to help them with various aspects of services transformation. So with that, let me, let me set the stage for um, parts variability and why this is all important. Um, if, if you haven't read this book, B for B, How Technology and Big Data Are Reinventing the Customer-Supplier Relationship, um, I would strongly recommend it as a great read. It, uh, the Technology Services Industry Association and, uh, um, and two of their, their executive team, Thomas Law and J.B. Wood, um, as well as an outside uh, author, uh, Todd Hewlin wrote this amazing book that it really is talking about things that I think a lot of us kind of knew, but they they put this in a I'll just say def defined the the what they now call the B for B operating environment into this uh, supplier operating models um, viewpoint of of a level one, level two, level three, and level four supplier, which yeah in a nutshell really talks about how the the ex expectations of our buyers, your buyers are moving from an expectation of getting things that are focused on on, 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 on price and reliability and uh, features and functions to an environment where we're all seeing much more of uh, our customers insisting on uh, buying better outcomes for the services and, and uh, products and capabilities that they're buying from, from us as, uh, as supplier companies. And so the, the book talks about that the transformational profiles of moving from a level one to a level four supplier uh, from product focused to outcome focused. And it's a great read and is certainly very applicable as we talk through parse variability here um, this morning. One of the, the, uh, the, 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 I think, really cool graphics that you'll see and, and uh, principles that they'll talk about in here um, is this you know, need to squish the fish. So as as field services operators, I, I'm sure there are people smiling on the phone when I affectionately say, uh, once, uh, how many times this week did the boss ask, how much more can we squeeze costs out of our field services operating budgets? And so when, when and then at the same time asking us to transform our businesses into leaner, meaner uh, organizations that can hopefully develop uh, and focus on better outcomes, start to help with generating better top line revenue growth, 
And so as operators, we've always been faced with this really difficult challenge of how do I free up dollars to allow me to invest in getting to where I can generate faster revenue growth, where I can actually lower labor costs, where I can make transformational changes important. So you're going to see, I think, a very good example in this webcast, two good examples of companies that have tackled the need to become much more strategic with services in their businesses, in, in this case, specific to field services and specific to parts cost management of using um, a, a way to generate um, tactical cost savings that could then be used with those savings to fuel uh, future changes in their businesses. So really excited about this. And again, B4B, a great, a great lead. When, when we engage a, a company, and both of the client examples we're going to use today are examples of companies that have started down a transformational path where we've been you know, proud to have had the opportunity to work with those companies on their uh, field services transformation and you know, beginning their B4B journeys from level one to level four suppliers. Um, and you know, and it starts with optimizing the, the current business models I shared is how do you deliver on your current financial plans and enable those investments to make this really important B4B journey. Um, and you know, which would be followed by you know, how do I turn my field services entity, as an example, into a, an engine of growth to develop a, a better value proposition um, for our customers, allowing them to consume the full value of our solutions, therefore generating hopefully better outcomes for those customers and achieving that you know, level four uh, supplier um, profile that uh, B4B talks about. And then lastly, in the, in the transformations, workforce transformation, we all know that our businesses operate uh, they're people intensive. And evolving our mission requires workforce transformation. It's, it's, it's training and culture and, and you know, different ways of doing the work that we do. And so we, we help companies with this um, uh, B4B journey through this four-step uh, transformational model. And again, today's webcast is really focused on two very real practical examples of how we've helped some clients to to build a um, their B4B, uh, to prepare, go down the track of their B4B journey um, by optimizing um, their, their cost model today. We we've, you've, you may have read from our white, our, some of the white papers we've distributed over the last uh, couple of years is, you know, we, we have professed this thing we call shift to the left where, you know, we really talk about, you know, channel optimization is one way to start to drive immediate tactical savings and costs. How do I move those, those, uh, incidents or in, incoming calls, um, requests for help uh, from the high cost channels um, um, to the lower cost uh, uh, channels that uh, where I potentially can solve the same problem um, with uh, in, a, in a better way, a, a technologically assisted way um, to drive costs out and by the way, at the same time, uh, raising quality and improving customer satisfaction. Um, there are three pretty cost areas that uh, we talk a lot about, about a lot. It's not, certainly not the only three cost areas, but, but three that generally jump to the top of the list is optimizing labor parts and, and uh, use of vehicles in managing our field services business. And you know, today we're going to focus specifically on parts, but we We've done a lot of work with clients helping them across you know, labor optimization, parts optimization, and certainly uh, vehicle fleet management uh, uh, challenges, and certainly other things. Uh, revenue uh, is, is an interesting part. As B4B would talk about a lot, I'm, I'm guessing Bill will touch on this and some of his comments is that services really should be looked at as a strategic aspect of how we can grow our uh, our, our product companies um, and uh, using field services, support services, uh, professional services as ways to grow uh, revenues and to become part of our strategic revenue growth plan, and we we help companies again certainly with that. And and uh, but part of this is again, how do you free up the investment dollars to to be able to get there? Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, before I I, I turn uh, the agenda to uh, to Bell is there are lots of ways to optimize how we manage parts in our businesses and. Uh, um, and, and certainly not going to go through all these lists, but you know we think about things where I can focus on just the simple costs of parts from you know what am I paying for it to you know exploring remanufactured versus repairing things versus buying new, 
uh, you know, commonality, simplicity of our designs uh, to reduce parts co uh, costs. And on the far right of this is logistics and management processes, right? Do we have, uh, are we using remote, remote solve uh, capabilities? Are we, we managing our inventory levels uh, correctly to make sure we have the right parts in the right place at the right time? And then there's this center uh, column that we're going to be talking more about today, and specifically variability is, is how we use our parts, you know, quality and technical proficiency and use of knowledge management tools. So we put a red circle around variability because today's webcast is really focused on one element of a multi-dimensional um, way, ways that we can attack um, parts optimization and, and variability, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webcast, is a place that is sometimes overlooked. Um, and until you really have the data, you really don't know. Um, and uh, as we have found with the, the clients we work with, this, uh, this typically is a great place to turf up opportunities to do the same job better um, for less dollars and improve customer satisfaction at the same time. So I hope that that sets a nice uh, stage for um, the balance of our webcast. And, and with that, I'm going to I'll uh, probably turn the agenda over to um, um, Bill uh, Golovsky, and I'll let Bill uh, spend a minute to introduce himself uh, uh, as VP of Research and Advisory at the, the Technology Services Industry Association. With that, Bill, um, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Randy, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, just a real quick uh, overview of uh, some of my experiences and, and the role I have at uh, TSIA. I, I bring uh, over 25 years of uh, services and sales experience uh, to the role, uh, and I've uh, been in companies uh, as, as, as big as uh, uh, Xerox and Bank of America and Kodak, and as well as some uh, smaller startups. So I have a pretty broad view of uh, uh, many different business models. I've also uh, written a book uh, based on uh, some of those activities uh, called Perpetual Innovation Machine, uh, how do you drive uh, continuous uh, breakthrough performance uh, in, in your businesses. Um, and I'm um, a Six Sigma uh, black belt, and you'll see uh, some of those fundamentals built into uh, our approach. So uh, Randy, if you could uh, move forward uh, one slide. I think. Uh, you know, as Randy described, uh, with the services operating model transformation, you know, anytime you make a big change in a business, uh, it, it obviously puts pressure. Your your model was built on the past, and and you have to move forward. Uh, many times, you'll have to bring new capabilities in, and those capabilities don't come free. And frankly, there is no pot of gold in the corner office uh, to fund these uh, things. And so what you really need to uh, look at and, and understand, and this is the, the message that we get back from all of our uh, field service members, is that they still have a plan to deliver this year. And uh, at the same time, they have to build an organization uh, for the future. The, the only way to really do that is that you, you have to find a way to uh, drive improvement and to be able to self-fund your, your, uh, your new capabilities and your growth so that you can succeed uh, well into the future. And uh, uh, just moving along to the, to the next slide here, um, benchmarking is critical to, to this activity because uh, you know, you, you, many companies basically try to uh, take a 10% task as an example, and without the insight, without the, the knowledge, you could pretty much just take that 10% and task it equally across all functions, whether you're at benchmark already or whether you've got uh, a, a, a lot of room to improve. And we all know that we're in, when we're in those types of situations, it, it's just not productive. And so benchmarking really uh, enables you to kind of fine tune uh, your approach and, and your tactics to, to make improvements. And uh, I, I like to use the analogy that says you only have so many bullets in your holster and you have to kind of pick and choose uh, where you're going to where you're going to take your shot. And so what I've got up on the screen right now is, uh, you know, just a, a concept of uh, how we've built out our, our benchmark. So if you want to improve cost, you know, if you want to try to find a way to self-fund your new capabilities into the future, uh, you have to look at all your costs. Uh, Randy shared uh, earlier, you, you have um, 
your top three cost areas, labor, parts, vehicles, et cetera. And, um, and so if you start to, to move from your cost and you start to slide over to the right, and we're going to focus on cost per incident today, uh, you, you want to look at what are the drivers of cost per incident and, and what can you do about it. So our, uh, our benchmark study is, is structured you know, in this manner to, to look at the cost to enable you to dig a little bit deeper and to find out where your improvement opportunities are. So on the, on the next slide, uh, if, if you look at this concept of, of variability, we have a, a lot of variability within the industry. And so when we look at uh, both the results and the, the metrics that are all out there in terms of how uh, field service uh, uh, operations perform today, there's a, there's a distribution. There are uh, you know, areas that are on target. And when we look at this with, um, uh, with the uh, PSIA benchmark methodology, we will identify for uh, each company where your performance lies uh, against the industry. And so if, if you're in the red, as an example, uh, you are clearly an outlier. And so it, it kind of tells us a, a little bit that says, hey, let's dig into uh, why you're an outlier and, and what we can do about it. So uh, uh, moving to the next slide, we're going to use cost per incident uh, as an example to kind of to bring this uh, uh, concept to, to, to light. So these are actual numbers, cost per incident, that we have from our uh, TSIA uh, benchmark. And you know, what we have is you know, the, the median is uh, $300 is the median cost per incident that we see. But that varies anywhere from 430 uh, at, at the uh, 25th percentile uh, down to $151. Uh, per incident. And then we've also introduced a concept, uh, what we call the pace setter. And that pace setter uh, shows that uh, the, the, not the best number we have in our, in our database, but the top 15% of performers uh, that are TSIA members are able to uh, get their cost per incident down to $83. So what, you know, what does this do for you, right? When, when you know uh, where you fit in the, in the variability within the industry overall, uh, it, it kind of uh, gives you an opportunity to say, well, why am I different and what can I uh, learn from it? So let's go back to the driver tree on, on the next slide. And so we, we've just seen that the, the cost per incident has this uh, uh, type of uh, results and performance within the industry. And, and you have a degree of, um, of variability. But, but what's the cause of that? Could it be the number of incidents per day that you have? Uh, could it be the mean time to repair or your, your labor rates or travel time? Maybe you don't have the density. And so you start to kind of dig in. And when, when you look at the benchmark, we're able to show and, and pinpoint if your cost per incident is in the red, as I just showed, uh, what, what's the cause? What could be the, the culprit? And let's start digging in a little bit deeper. And then you, you can go a, a few more steps uh, through this driver tree to kind of narrow things down. And then uh, as, as you run through this type of analysis, uh, what we're able to provide uh, through this, this benchmarking activity is we want you to know not only how does your, your overall performance compare, but we wanted, we're able to show you uh, for both your results and your metrics uh, how you compare. Uh, we also show you what your strengths are and uh, if your performance is different, why it's different. And then you know, we're able to throw on uh, some, some practices that you can begin to implement to start to uh, in, improve your, your operation. So, so think of this uh, driver tree as you know, if, if I want to improve cost, I can go left to right and it'll show me uh, uh, what's driving my cost and, and uh, what I can do to improve it. And at the same time, you know, when we have practices that we can share with you, we can say, hey, you can implement these practices and then what should I expect to get in return when I implement these uh, in, in terms of uh, a, a benefit. So the, the TSIA benchmark really kind of looks at it uh, all the way through, helps you focus and, and tells you um, uh, basically areas that, that you need to improve. And, and, and frankly, how to do it. So um, moving, moving along to the, to the next slide, um, 
many of you may have, have, have seen a similar chart uh, uh, in, in the past, but when you look at variability and, and how it impacts uh, your performance improvement initiatives, you know, it, it always follows a, a, a certain uh, discrete number of steps. And, you know, the, the first one is that you got to identify your, your baseline performance. So we do that with the benchmark. But what Bill is going to share with you in a moment is that you've identified maybe what your average is for your company. Within your company, you will always have a degree of variability. Not everybody's going to do it exactly the same way. And, and one of the first things that you're going to have to do, and, and really the, the, the point of, of this uh, uh, webinar today, is that first and foremost, you have to reduce the variability. That's step two. After that, you know, when you, when you have a, a narrow level of performance and, and you kind of understand what your capability is within your system, then you really have an opportunity in steps three and four to understand what causes that variability and then how to drive improvement uh, for, for the long haul. And so um, there, there are a couple tools. We've got some links in here that you can go uh, look at uh, afterwards uh, through this, um, uh, you know, through the, the, the presentation. Uh, but, but there are some, some simple tools, statistical tools that you can use that will help you uh, in, your, uh, in your efforts. And, um, and so just uh, in, in closing, I think that, um, you know, the, the benchmarking is, is always a critical first step in any of these efforts. Uh, and then to be able to know where you are and, and where your variability lies, I, I think that uh, you'll, you'll see some very impressive uh, results uh, that, that Bill is about to share on uh, how much you can save to, uh, to actually self-fund some of these uh, uh, improvement and new capabilities that you're going to need to succeed in the future. So, uh, Bill, I'm going to pass this along to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, hey, uh, so this is Randy again. I, I want to again reintroduce uh, Bill Steenberg, uh, Senior Vice President of Global Services at, at Bitney Bowes. And uh, Bill and I are going to tag team this section on the, uh, some quick case studies, both with uh, Bill's company at Bitney Bowes and, and uh, uh, NCR uh, as well. So, Bill, with that, I'm going to tee you up. Thanks, Randy. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great, great. Look, I'm just going to give a little background on myself um, for the context of this conversation, right? I, I've had 18 years uh, with Eastman Kodak Company in the services side. Um, when we transitioned the business uh, to Danka Corporation, I was a senior vice president of Danka Service Worldwide Support at that time. Um, I've had, uh, you know, I have, had 12 years of service with Xerox Corporation running that, now I'm with Pitney Bowes. And, one of the things that are uh, similar for all four of those companies that I just want to call the light, and it's the opportunity that variability provides you and the fact that it's, it's one of the first areas you really ought to take a look at going after because it's something that's controllable to you at the end of the value stream. And, and you have to have cross-functional processes and, and other areas to where for the systemic, systemic uh, opportunities, uh, be it commercialization or new product launch. But, this, this variability end is within your own control. And, um, you know, we're, we're within Bentley Bowes actively following. Number one, we're, we're TSI mem TSIA members, and Vail's comments about the learnings and the benchmarking are, are really important to us and is a great reason to join for us the TSI at certain available, uh, valuable membership. And from an RTM perspective, we're clients of RTMs, and, and we are on a journey um, following the script uh, that Randy presented on how to get to an outcome-based model. And it is, as Randy said, we're following a four-step strategy. We're, you know, we're optimizing our current business model, and, and that's because these constant cost productivities are required to deliver this financial plan, and as Randy said, to invest in the future. That uh, you know we're 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 looking at developing a really aggressive uh, services engine of growth, right? And that'll help us develop new incremental revenue streams um, because we've got a legacy business and, and a new business we're standing up. So we have a a legacy capex business of uh, you sell a product and then the service delivery follows it. 
And then there's OPEX, you know, professional services, consultative type services that need to be stood up around the solution so that the customer can enjoy that outcome base, right? And that's the value proposition that Randy talked about, how to enable uh, Petty Bow's clients to consume that full value of the solution that we sold them and actually probably care about the client's desire, uh, you know, to drive their own business results more than anything else. And that does involve a significant transformation of our workforce. So I, I just want to reiterate that the strategy that Randy called out is, is a very powerful script for a lot of companies to be able to uh, follow it. And, and then when you get to the optimizing of the business model, right, you've got a channel optimization opportunity, as Randy talked, we're following that. But then you, you got to take a look at your cost buckets, right? And for us, you know, our top three cost buckets, and it'll be similar for a lot of you, you know, you look, if I need the labor, you know, parts and, and maybe your vehicles and your travel, you're, you're probably 80 to 90% of your total cost, and that's certainly true within us. And, and within that context, it, that means you got to go after parts, and for us, the variability was an opportunity. So that, that's how we ended up uh, here in this journey. So we're, we're working with our TMC to follow a, a what I'll call a simplified Lean Six Sigma or Demaic process, uh, heavy on the Lean portion of that. So you know, the first part of a Demaic, you know, define, measure, uh, assess, approve, and control is, is to define it. So this is. A simple, easy way to look at uh, that. It's, you know, I, I've watched people do very robust charters. I don't know if you need a robust charter as much as do you understand what your problem statement. You know, and for us, it's you know, we, we, we thought originally we had a significant variability of parts expense, and I'll show you when we get to there. Uh, you'll see that there is. Um, there's a high degree of variability in work practices globally. Right there's even within domestic operations or within country there's that that by the time you become a global operation in countries all over the world there are a lot of variability in work practices and, and we really didn't understand um, or do an effective job as we could at sharing the best practices so that, that's the simplest problem statements you come up with the objective is really simple it's reduce parts variability and, and, and more importantly us the our results measure right is a parts cost. And so the whole thing is about how to reduce the parts cost savings that we're going to get from a variability reduction. And you know how many standard deviations can you actually reduce that? And I'm going to turn it over to Randy because this is a journey we're in mid-process on, but Randy's also going to share another client, the start of their journey and the end of their journey. I shouldn't say the end because the journey goes on forever, but they've got more uh, time under their belt attacking the variability. And so it's a... Uh, it gives you a very good look at the quantitative results that you're actually going to get out of this. So, Randy, let me turn it over to the measure phase compliant one at least. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Bill. So, uh, yeah, NCR uh, has been a client of ours for a number of years, and uh, last October they were at the uh, Technology Services World Conference in Las Vegas, and they were one of the speakers um, on, our, uh, on a panel that we had uh, talking about uh, some of their transformational initi uh, initiatives and, and and they spoke about uh, their how they uh, worked uh, to attack parts variability, and it's a project we worked with them on last year. And it's one that's run its full course. As Bill said, it'll continue to go on, but um, they, they do have specific results, which I'll share here as we go through this uh, webcast. But at the front end of the of the journey on on parts variability, which is one area that we worked with them to attack, was. We started, you know, using Lean Six Sigma, you know, capturing data to really understand what was going on in the various territories uh, that NCR had. And you see that the, the graph on the left is that uh, overall, all the territories are within roughly ten bucks, uh, you know, on a, on a work order basis. And uh, but, however, one you know just really jumps off the chart, you know, relative to what was going on there. And so. Um, so if you looked at uh, you know a more uh, deeper dive into that particular uh, district, you find you know you, you get more data on what's actually going on within the district, and, and uh, significant variability came on three different operational expense levels, and and it basically allows uh, you know allowed us to to shine a light on where there were opportunities for whatever reason to drive potentially cost. Um, out of the uh, out of the business model for them to again fuel their uh, efforts to move from a, a level one to a level four supplier uh, as well. So this uh, I think is really kind of a nice picture, and we'll kind of we'll show you the both the, this being the before picture as an example, one piece of data. And we'll show you the after picture here in a in a moment. So let me shift back into to Bill 
um, to talk more about the pivoting. Thanks, uh, Randy. So here's another view, right? Um, so we wanted to show you this view of, of when you measure your variability you can look at. And, and you obviously need to take a look at it at the different product and platform levels you have. And this is for one of our um, business units within uh, Pitney Bowes where we look at the, the cost per million, right? And so you've got a big variability. So what you can see here is, is a really large range for the cost cost per call and, and cost per million on that you got it. So in this case, your, your range, uh, you know, you got outliers way up around 500 uh, on the, the SMB business. And then on this end of the business, it's even greater, you can see. And in the individual variability, if you could go in any one of these areas, it's obviously great too. Now, as Val was saying, you need to understand why that variability is there. There is some variability that is rational and logical that you can understand, but there's others that you, you really got to get in and under, understand when you get into the territory or geo level as to why it's there. So that's where you come to the next slide, and you really have to assess it. And so you need to, and this is a fairly quick process that you can do, right? Um, and you get together a group of SME subject matter experts and you start pulling together, you know, Bale talked about a power tool being an Ishikawa or a fishbone, right? And identify the primary causes, right? So just brainstorm all the reasons why you could have variability and then, you know, start affinitizing them and, and asking things like the five whys on the top opportunity that you got once you have them and, and then you, you prioritize and develop what your countermeasures are going to go after. And I've um, always have been a big believer, uh, personally and professionally, in, in a benefit-effort matrix. Um, not enough organizations focus on the vital few or where they have to put their energy. And most service delivery organizations have 10,000 things to do today, and there's never enough time. So the question is, you know, the benefit-effort matrix is one way of looking at how to get there. And, uh, you know, Randy just moved us forward to a, you know, a simple cause and effect or Ishikawa diagram. And I'm not going to break it down, but you can you can see the major things, whether the parts variability is caused by a client or the individual equipment. Uh, it could be a people or training or process issue, parts quality. There's a lot of reasons why you've got the variability. But before you, you get in there, you want to understand them all. Then you want to look, and this we've highlighted some of the top causes and opportunities. And then you really begin to work, you know, an action register of what your countermeasures are actually going to be, right? And you end up with a usually a, a very robust big countermeasure, a series of countermeasures and, and more than you can probably process um, given the limited bandwidth that everybody has in today's world. So that's where the next slide comes in where you can really step back and group them together and get to a, a benefit effort matrix, right? And it's, it's simplest format on the left-hand side, it's what's your benefit Right, so you know, in this case, the scale is kind of small. Sometimes it's a lot higher, but you know, what initiatives can give you anywhere from 50 to 100,000? Which ones are greater than 100,000? Some of them are significantly greater than that. And then, kind of on the effort and the bottom line is, is effort and time. You know, how, how how much time does it take, and how complex is it, and also how much of it is controllable, and at what level, right? And those are important things to consider um, as you're heading down the path, and then you. You know, you ought to look at them. And so we just put a few of them on this slide, right? So uh, for us, you know, having an, a, an effective balance scorecard that, that points out the variability opportunity to people to make them aware of it becomes very, very important, right? Creating training around, a business awareness training around how variability, if you can get into it, really gets you a, a big bang for the buck when you're looking at your cost structure and your P&L, right? So, I'm not going to go through all the ones here again, but there's a lot of different things you can build in. But the, the concept, I think, that we work with our TMC on of a, a summary benefit effort matrix becomes really, really important as you look to where to put your limited resources. And um, now we haven't, you know, we're just we're we're in the uh, implementation stages, and but we certainly have big expectations built in. There's a you know an eight-digit year-over-year improvement um, in cost from this, and it's being captured in, you know, outlooks and financial plans, um, and, and, and we're, we're on that path. But what I'd want to do is turn it back to Randy to share the client he was talking about earlier and their journey, because they're farther on the journey than we are. So, uh, Randy? Okay. So, well, so in this case, I showed you a before 
picture at, at, at NCR, and uh, this is really more the after picture that, um, again, they showed at the, the conference last October. And you know, as we went through the, the process we talked about, we uh, again use the Lean Six Sigma in our, our four-step process to uh, you know help begin this journey. We we you know got the data to help identify where the variability was really occurring. We looked at usage trends on a variety of dimensions. Um, Establish some benchmarks, um, and um, they then use a variety of training tools and best practices to actually get at um, improvements in the things that we had identified um, in the uh, in the project. And as you can see from the graphs, just two key things I'll point out from the data below is that in a pretty short period of time, uh, drove substantial savings. Um, that again are now available to put to the bottom line, or and or to reinvest in future um, uh, initiatives that they need to transform on their services business, and and at the same point of time is this not just the cost; it's uh, again uh, the consistency consistency of better variability, and you can see the graph on the right uh, shows a you know clear changes in the uh, variability that was occurring um, you know across their variety of their uh, different uh, territories, and so. Uh, you know, performance uh, you know, certainly improved, cost big reduction in a short period of time, and, and both things that uh, you know, field services operators are are really important uh, for these businesses. So this stuff really does. Uh, they're trying two processes that can really really work well, and uh, you know, we're quite confident working with uh, with with Pitney that uh, you know Bill and his team and with us are going to you know get at the the the, the needs that they have to turp up. Um, savings because um, I know Bill's got big plans on, on his transformational efforts at Pitney Bowes um, as well. So um, let's just move on to the, I'll, I'll finish with a, a quick summary here and then we're going to uh, take the time to take uh, some Q&A um, and Thomas Meredith will, will moderate but just a few tips from the trenches here is you know again is, is the B4B B journey is you know part of this is I got to have money to invest and the way to invest you know get the money to invest is to deliver on your financial results today, and a way to do that is to find ways to tactically turf up uh, uh, performance improvements. And purchase variability again is one that's often overlooked as a way to to, uh, to to do that. And it's one that, by the way, you know, to to the title that we put on this webcast is uh, control the controllable. It's one that's usually very much in the in the in the hands of of the um, individuals running the field services business. It's not one where uh, a heavily matrix environment necessarily can get in the way of this, and so it's one of those things you can get at pretty quickly. Um, so optimize that for your current business model. Control the controllable. Uh, you know, Bill, you know, mentioned about uh, really an emphasis on lean in the process. It just doesn't take a a huge amount of over engineering, but it does need to be fact based. Um, there there is a fair amount of benchmarking um, uh, and research data available uh, through the Technology Service Industry Association. And you know, in the end, is data is very powerful. Is it is using those numbers to help you manage your businesses. Don't let the you know the business uh, don't do not manage the business by the numbers. Um, and, and and clearly, you know, one of the things we think we can bring to the table here is is uh, you know the been there, done that, and you know we've kind of seen it all as it relates to things related to parts variability and other aspects of field services. And I hope between us and and the uh, things that Technology Services Industry Association can do for uh, for you that you'll reach out to us. As Thomas uh, uh, mentioned, there is a PDU available. I'll, I'll turn this uh, back to Thomas so I can moderate the Q&A session at this point. So Thomas, the, uh, back to you. Thank you, Rainey, and uh, thank you as well, Val and Bill. Uh, yes, uh, as you can see on your screen now, we do uh, are offering a PDU credit for this, um, and you can write down the activity number there as well. Um, also, you can search uh, RTM Consulting as a REP on the site, a registered education provider, and you can find uh, uh, the course and the activity that way as well. So that information is there for you. We have had a few questions uh, come in. So I'd like to get to those, but again, please uh, feel free to uh, add any more uh, as, as they come to you during this Q&A session. Um, so I'll start here with this question that came in. You know, I'll start with you, Randy, but uh, you know, probably interested in Bill's perspective as well. But uh, let me start off with you, Randy. Um, they ask, uh, it, he asks, isn't it possible that some regions or districts uh, might have good reasons for parts performance uh, that just can't be fixed uh, to the degree that perform the same as other regions or districts? 
Uh, yeah, so good question. Um, you know, it, it's certainly um, every, you know, district or region or however you might be organized for your, your field services business, um, the, the size of that particular district or region, the, the work mar the uh, labor market in that particular area, you know, availability of parts, whatever it might happen to be, there are certainly factors that may make the ability of one particular district or region um, uh, more challenging, let's just say, than, than, than others. But, you know, just in general, though, there, there are ways to tackle those, um, you know, I'll call more um, structural problems in those regions where labor is just going to be a bigger challenge over time or, or perhaps uh, the, 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 the volume of business that you're doing um, or whatever it might be. So, you know, we've seen the ability to actually impact those just uh, certainly in a positive way. And the objective isn't that we get every single region operating exactly the same from a parts variability standpoint. The question is, can we get them, you know, narrow the band of uh, the, the peaks and valleys um, to where we get the you know, optimal performance out of, out of every district or region um, in your, your FS uh, business. Um, but Bill, I, I don't know if you have a, a, anything else to, to add or... No, I think that that's great, Randy. You're self-explanatory. I think the statistical significance, you know, goes up with the amount of data. If it's one individual in a remote area that's significantly different than, than somebody else who's covering one product family, that may be one of the causes, right? So I think that's why you do the assessment, right? And you, and you put together the Chicago and ask the five whys, and, and then I think you can get to there. And, and I do think you mentioned something powerful, Randy, in your passing there, and that's that this, this works for uh, almost all your expenses. So, if you, you know, the, the whole conversation around parts plays out with labor also, and that you ought to be doing this in, in labor in a lot of the field services structures is significantly larger, and you ought to be attacking variability in your labor uh, the same way, right? They're different. They're different. It's a different looking at Chicago, but it's the same, same thing. Right. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Yep. Thanks, guys. Uh, Val, this one came in uh, while you were going over uh, your slides and, and specifically around your benchmarking uh, data. Um, uh, of course, uh, she wants to look at uh, someone or a similar organization as hers. So she asked, how specific is the data to a particular industry? Yeah, I think you know one of the uh, biggest benefits of, of looking at, at benchmarking is uh, you know, really what you're trying to do is, is see how you compare overall. Uh, right. With the TSIA benchmark, you know, we've, we've kind of put all the data through the, through the grinder. And uh, what we found was that uh, it was less, you know, the, the, the variability had less to do with a specific industry, and it really had more in, in to do with uh, what type of business model you were currently operating under. And uh, you know, so we, we, we begin to draw comparisons in, in that fashion first and, and to show you some of the, uh, the differences. The, the benefit of looking at it that way and looking at the broader uh, industry is that a lot of times breakthroughs come from an adjacent industry. So, so uh, while it may be comforting to look at somebody that does exactly what you do, you know, makes, you know, control valves or makes uh, mail handling systems, uh, uh, you know, that, that can kind of be comforting because you say, okay, I'm, I'm as good as that person I'm competing with. But if the objective is to actually drive breakthrough performance, by looking at that pace setter, and even though it's in an adjacent industry, what you can start to see is that, hey, they figured out a way to do things differently, and what can I learn from them, and what can I bring into play? So, um, so the, the, you know, we, we do have industry comparisons, so I, I but I think the, the bigger value comes from uh, when you look at these pace setters and you begin to look at the broader um, uh, the, the, the broader picture and, and participants to you know to, to bring that knowledge into your operation. Thanks, Al. Uh, Bill, I, I've got one here for you. Um, I, I certainly uh, you know we've heard RTM Consulting's uh, perspective on this. Um, and, and you've mentioned it a little bit, but I, I think it bears going over again. Uh, this was uh, for you, and it said, uh, why are you attacking uh, variability here? You're an operational leader. Why are you attacking variability? Why is it so important to you? Yeah, I, I think that plays to the strategy of, um, you know, the first step. I, I think there's some sequential and there's some uh, parallel paths you have to do on that four-step transformation process. But the first step, I think, for any 
delivery organization today, um, and, and many of them are calling themselves profit centers, but still operate way too much as a cost center, right? But the first thing is you, you, you've got to be able to deliver those financial results, um, particularly in large public corporations. You know, you got to deliver the results on a quarterly basis, an annual basis, and then have a long-term strategy to get you to or towards it, right? And um, this becomes a really big part of delivering the plan, your cost structure. And variability for parts and labor is something that is tactical that you can address on your own, as Randy said. Um, uh, you have to do the other stuff, the systemic cross-functional things uh, and product life cycle or that, you know, Randy had that slide up with parts looking at three different areas. You still have to execute all that, but this is one you can move pretty quick on. So it gives you the dollars, not only to meet the plan, but then invest um, in the revenue growth engine, which you have to get to, otherwise you're going to be you know, your job's going to be to milk a cash cow or to harvest a, a legacy revenue stream and you'll never get a chance to set up the new one. Hey, hey Bill, this is Val. Yes. I could just add, you know, I think one of the, the understated reasons why you have to eliminate variability, you know, I, I tried to share that on the, on the chart, uh, that if you don't reduce the variability, you don't know if any of your other improvement op opportunities are, are working. Uh, you know, yep. if, if, when you look at the numbers a little bit closer, you'll start to see that, you know, the, the best performing division versus the worst performing division, they could have variability of, uh, you know, 15 to 20 percent. If you're thinking about implementing a, an improvement program that will give you a 10 percent improvement, you may be working on the right stuff, but you'll never see it because the rest of your organization is, is so, uh, uh, you know, using the word variable that uh, you can't see the improvement. So if you really want to transform your business, you, you've got to get people consistent and you've got to eliminate that variability and then you'll be able to see what's working and what's not working. Agree wholeheartedly. Right, thanks guys. Uh, Randy, let me come back to you. We had this one that come in, came in and I would just like to get your perspective on it. Uh, would not the way the customer uses and cares for the product be one of the biggest key factors in reducing part variability? Uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to let Bill take that one. Uh, uh, okay. So what would you say? What would you say? I, I, I think it becomes one. It depends on the company and the industry. And certainly, you know, if you look at the fishbone and the Ishikawa, the client becomes one of the uses for that, right? Um, but I'm not going to say that that's not controllable. Very often, uh, you know, helping the, the client clean up their environment. Um, setting the proper expectations, and it's tough if you've already got the solution installed, but you may have to go back and, and revisit the expectations you set up front, uh, how you communicate with a client, um, training the client how to do self-service on their own, right? Um, all those things are ways that you can help influence client variability, but yet you will see variability, Thomas, at all levels, and client's one of them, but the question I think becomes more importantly in the assessment process is what are the big ones and what do you do about it to fix it, right? Right. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Yep, thanks, Bill. Uh, Randy, here, I, I've got one here for you and I'll, I'll, I'll go to you because, uh, you know, Bill certainly has a Pitney Bowes um, uh, perspective <laughs> on this, but uh, since you've worked uh, with, with different clients, um, he asks, how do we get management to let us invest in, you know, addressing, fixing uh, the park variability problem? Um, because we all know it takes time and effort to do this. So could you lend some perspective on that? Yeah, so, I, you know, simply I'd go back to the, you know, you got to invest, uh, you got to find the tactical savings to invest in, in fixing stuff, right? And so the, the good news here is in the upfront fun part of this problem of, of solving for parts variability is getting your data. Um, it's getting a, a view of what's really going on, and that's not the expensive part. It's not the hard part, um, and, and it is you know, whether you're able to do it yourself or you ask us to help, it's, it's the least expensive part of the problem. And then once you have the data um, to show what the opportunities are, um, then you can start to put uh, you know numbers to that to then you know show the boss. Hey, look, here's uh, here's what we want to be able to go attack, and, and we're going to need some money to do this. The good news is uh, it's a short-term spend to get a long-term spend, and you know m most executives, I believe, uh, respond well to factual financial data that you're willing to be accountable for. 
And so, you know, getting the data here is important. I think, you know, TSIA's uh, benchmark data, research data can be helpful in kind of pointing to hey, here's where we want to we want to get, um, in our, and that we're being proactive in trying to find ways to drive uh, better uh, cost efficiencies. Not, a, not to mention, by the way, you know, if you improve your parts variability, you're, you'll find that, uh, you know, generally speaking, you're serving a client better uh, as well. So, you know, it, get the data up front. It's not the most expensive part of the problem. And once you have that data, now you have the ammunition you need to go, you know, potentially ask for the, the opportunity to invest in, in the, the remedies. And that I would, I would say we, we encourage the same kind of, of, of approach or behavior or whatever you want, how you want to describe that in every aspect of, of transformation, put numbers on, hey, look, the, you know, getting from here to there is going to cost some money. The good news is, though, once the fix is conducted, um, the savings go on generally forever as long as we continue to, uh, to operate uh, with our improved best practices. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. And Randy, uh, this is Val. Once again, just to, uh, to build on what you said, uh, if you have a, a validated benchmark and, and you know how the other people got to that benchmark, you, you can do the math and, uh, and you'll, you'll be able to see what that return is. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's another benefit of, uh, you know, taking this type of approach because, you know, you're not going out there saying, well, I can generically reduce this by 20%. You're saying, hey, I've, I've got a benchmark. I know what we need to do. Here's uh, what the return looks like, and this is what it's going to take, uh, which, which any manager, um, you know, will, will be able to take a look at that and, and decide if it makes sense or not. Thanks, Al. Okay, guys, we are uh, right. We've got a few more minutes here before the top of the hour, so I'd like to stick to our allotted time. Um, again, the information there, if you wanted to claim a PDU credit, uh, was there. Also, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that a copy of the deck is available. Um, you can uh, email us at uh, info at rtmconsulting.net, and I can get a copy of the deck sent out for you. We have uh, contact information on the screen now for Randy and Val as well and you can certainly send questions uh, their way. So again, I'd like to thank Val and Bill for sharing their perspectives with us today. I really appreciate the time and the information. Uh, Randy, uh, you as well, thank you for uh, sharing uh, your information as well. And did you have any uh, anything else you wanted to close with? I, I just want to say thank you for everyone for attending, and a special thanks to Val and to, to Bill. We really appreciate uh, your sharing your perspectives with uh, with um, the folks that have joined the webcast today. We very much appreciate that and, and appreciate your, your, your time. So with that, yep. I think we're, 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 we're done. Yep, thanks, Randy. And I'd like to thank uh, everyone on the line as well. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, we will be signing off now. Uh, so uh, have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks.